Okay, so um, hi everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome back to the um, to the New Tech Mini School series on uh, energy materials. So um, today is our third lecture in the the Mini School series. Um, I'm Dr. Graham Pleasants. Um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher uh, based at Stellenbosch University in the uh, the, the research group of uh, Professor Francesco Pritticcioni, who's the uh, the current interim director of, of NITEC. Um, and today, uh, so our third lecture this afternoon will be presented by uh, Dr. Kingsley Abodo, and uh, he will be delivering a talk uh, entitled Computational Modeling Using High Performance Computing for Materials Prediction and Design. Um, so in our previous sessions, uh, Dr. Abodo has read out the person's biography, so obviously he can't do it today. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read out your, I'll give you a thorough introduction before you uh, can begin your presentation. Okay, so Dr. Dr. Aboro is a computational scientist in the High Essay Center of Competence at Northwest University. His background is in ab initio computational modeling of various materials with key interests in the applications of physics, material science, philosophical thinking towards innovations in energy and material solutions, as well as research design and development towards sustainability. Dr. Abodo has authored and drafted several technical reports for different projects in addition to numerous publications in peer-reviewed uh, peer journals. He has over 10 years of experience in research and development with expertise in scientific programming languages. He plays roles, uh, he, yeah, he, play roles, he plays roles in various projects that have deployed quantitative and, quantitative and qualitative research output as well as applied these to problems in education, ICT, business and social science among others. He also has several local and international collaborations and is actively engaged in student supervision and mentoring. Um, so before I hand over to, to Dr. Aboro, I'll just briefly mention um, to um, please feel free to make use of the, the Q&A facility in, um, in Zoom. So if you have a question, please feel free to type it in there. And towards the end of the, um, um, the presentation, um, I'll be able to read out your question to the speaker. Alternatively, if you would prefer to, to ask your question in person, um, then I can, um, then at the end, when we do the questions, you'll be able to um, raise your hand and then I'll, I'll be able to unmute you and, sh and you should be able to ask your question in person to our, to our speaker. Okay, so without any further delay, I can hand over to um, Dr. Kingsley Abodo. Um, thank you very much. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, the third speaker in these, um, Colloquium, and I hope you've enjoyed the last two talks you've attended. I would um I would go over this is my outline. So in today's talk, I will dwell a lot more on Edwidian Dope services for OER. And then I'll just introduce you to the basics of um platinum model um, um PT modified based services for the hydrogenation reaction. And then I'll quickly talk about um another system, which is um, thin platform-based offices. You've heard a lot about photocatalysis and photovoltaic systems. I would um, just glance over this and I'll talk about some of the collaborations and um, some students we have. So um, just a short overview. I'm based in Hydrogen South Africa, which is a Department of Science and Innovation Center. And this was um, founded as part of the national strategy for PGM beneficiation, so the platinum group metal. And part of the HISA um, mandate is to fill in some of the loopholes that was created, some of the loopholes that exist in terms of R&D in developing hydrogen infrastructure. So we form sort of part of the hydrogen value chain. Now, just um, another thing about HISA, currently we have a huge refuel, um, a refueling station in South Africa. And in South Africa, there are currently two Toyota Maras, and these cars are being refueled in our, one of, in our hydrogen refueling station. And the reason for this is because of the purity of hydrogen we produce and also the pressure. So we can refuel up to 350 bars. Now, um, about me, I always like to talk about me. I'm from a rural village in Enugu State, which is um, Amandimolo in Nigeria, for those of you that know. Uh, Amandimolo is in Isiago local government in Enugu State. 
So uh, just thinking about it, I had to travel about 6,500 kilometers to be in South Africa, which is kind of far. So if you have to travel from um, South Africa to Enugu, you would go through, especially using a Nigerian passport, it's totally impossible because of lots of visa restrictions and limitations. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. What we're here to talk about today is, can we have sustainable energy development that thinks about the people, that builds a social contract with the people, that um, addresses the issue in pattern based in Africa, such as energy independence and um, also economic freedom, while addressing climate and um, environmental issues. So these our solutions need to be centered on um, the countries that we are interested in, as well as the indigenous people. So you kind of see that the solutions we propose here using computational modeling is very Africa-centric and particularly South Africa-centric. Now, um, thinking about this, uh, especially in the South African context, we have significant energy challenges. The load shedding schedule was uh, moved, I think, now to state three or four. So we need to think about how we do our experiments to bring down R&D costs, and computational modeling does that. And also part of the questions we try to understand is, can we develop new and advanced materials that can have implication in energy storage technologies? And while we're trying to develop these new materials, can we also think about how to fundamentally understand the processes involved in these renewable energy technologies, taking into context our African situation. Now, if you look at the, the global primary energy sources, most of our sources are from oil, coal, and traditional biomass. We have very few sources from um, other sources, um, renewables, but this map is drastically changing significantly. And if we go forward and say, okay, what are the technologies we have if we can generate renewable technology energy? What are the technologies we have to store this energy? We have various technologies that are being worked on, such as battery technology, which was talked about by the previous speaker, Amir Dofana. And we have electricity that, um, that, that are only within the grid. We have um, pumped hydrogen and compressed air, which we can use to store in energy. But the problem with this is that it's not very flexible and um, in various locations is not suitable. We also have hydrogen, which could be a solution for large scale and long term storage solutions. Now, if you think about hydrogen, we have various means for storing hydrogen. We have, um, and this hydrogen can be stored in various in various ways on liquid organic hydrogen carriers, on metal oxides, on um, lithium hydrides and a whole host of others. So I would I would discuss um, liquid organic hydrogen carriers in my um, subsequent pre in the in the in the subsequent presentation. Now but just thinking about why hydrogen now um hydrogen's potential role in the energy system is quite immense. And part of the reason is because you can use it as um, liquid and gaseous fuels. You can use hydrogen for feedstocks, you can use hydrogen as an energy carrier. But apart from that, it's a flexible energy carrier that can be produced from any primary source. So we can convert any source to hydrogen. And then we can also transform this generated, hydro this generated energy we store in hydrogen in form of chemical bonds into other various forms of energy. So the, the uh, implication is that to integrate these into uh, the variable nature of renewable energy systems is quite easy. And I mentioned at the beginning that the potential for PGM benefici beneficiation, we South Africa rely on, and PGM is the platinum group metal is very high. So if we can beneficiate PGM, we can also improve the value chain of platinum group metals, and this can add to South African national development. So it, ha it has immense implication. So now, hydrogen economy via catalysis. In this area, I'll look at our iridium dope surfaces for OER, which is oxygen evolution reaction. I'll discuss the impact of modifying platinum based surfaces and actually introducing um, some tin into platinum based surfaces as well. Uh, this project was recently given a green light by Shell, and they're going to build a 200 megawatt green hydrogen plant. 
And so this would make use of, um, if you think about it, looking at the center of the structure, this would make use of huge electrolyzer systems. So what the electrolyzer system does is that it splits water into oxygen and hydrogen, and the energy to split this water into oxygen and hydrogen is gotten from renewable energy sources, from the um, from wind farms. So uh, just um, for those of you that don't know, that don't that have not seen what um, a typical electrolyzer looks like, this is an electrolyzer design. So we have our solid polyelectrolyte cell, which is what we are more interested in in this system. We have our anode materials, and then we have our cathode. Our anode material is where you have the oxygen evolution reaction. And then in the cathode layer, you've got the hydrogen evolution reaction. And you have a certain amount of current that drives the splitting of water. So you can have hydrogen coming out here that is being stored. And then you have oxygen that we can air out. Now, the problem with this kind of system is that um, we need to overcome the overpotential for oxygen since oxygen is a multi-electron process, and as we'll see it in the subsequent slide. So it's you, uh, uh, for this reaction to proceed, we need electricity, which we get from renewable energy sources. Now we have another system, which is our solid um, oxide electrolysis. I wouldn't be going into this, and part of the reason is because this system uses a lot of um, very high energy. So it will be suited for places where you have a lot of heat, so you can see heat drives the reaction. Now, um, just looking at from the huge scale of um, looking at um, the huge scale, I showed you about 200 gig megawatts. Now, we can actually model, we can actually reduce this problem to more or less a fundamental problem, which is uh, in the microscope, in the microscopic scale. So you can come from a problem in the microscopic scale and then you reduce it all the way to the microscopic scale. So a lot of my presentation will be focused on the microscopic scale. But you can also do a lot of modeling in a different landscape, which is the microscopic, mesoscopic, and the macroscopic. Uh, I just want to show this slide just to give you an idea of, um, since my, my the title of my talk talked about computational modeling and high-performance computing. Now, if you think about what we're trying to do, we'll be using Abbey initial modeling using one um, um, caster. And so these are some of the parameters that we use. So we are interested in the energetic, in the electronic properties, as well as the energetics. The computational details, these are fully optimized and we use the non-cons Abbey pseudo potential. Now the need for uh, computational resource, the number of calculations we are going to do is over 240 calculations. And if you think about the system size, our atoms are about 120 atoms. So carrying out this kind of computation in your local um, desktop, maybe it's possible in principle, but the number of, it will take you a um, couple of years to evaluate just this one study. Now, um, I sort of introduce you to water electrolysis. Now, the overall reaction for water electrolysis involves splitting of water using electric current. So you've got two hydrate, um, two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen. And like I mentioned, the big barrier there is the overpotential for the reaction to proceed. And the overpotential for the reaction to proceed can be calculated as the maximum of can be calculated as the maximum of the Gibbs free energy. And you would see where this various Gibbs free energy comes from. And this is actually the principal source of um, the principal source of inefficiency in our anode reaction is as we are in the anode and the cathode part of our reactions, which I've showed in the previous slide, is attributed mainly to the high overpotential of this reaction. And the overpotential was also discussed when we talked about battery system in the previous lecture. Now, just um, showing you a bit more details, but I'll go into detail, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this in more details. Now for the acidic, for an acidic medium, so this reaction, the water splitting reaction can happen in two medium, in the, either in the acidic medium or in the alkaline medium. And for the cathode part, which is the hydrogen evolution reaction, our over potential for the cathode layer is about, it's about zero, but for the anode part, it's about 1.23 electron volt. 
Uh, the proposed mechanism is this for the acidic medium I'll go into detail in the subsequent slide. Now, we're not so much interested in under alkaline um, electrolysis. And part of the reason is because this, this technology is very mature. It's been, um, it's been developed since um, the 19, um, since the 1950s. And it's at uh, it's at a, it's at a super matured stage, and and the second part of the reason and the second reason is that um, in terms of uh, the use of TTM based metals is very low, and um, this does not add a lot of value to South Africa in particular. So, just um, a diagrammatic representation of the overall reaction, and then I'll go into more detail. Now, something important as a scaling relation was developed, and then this scaling relation resulted in a volcano type plot where we can have our um, over potential as a function of the Gibbs free energy of the of the oxygen minus the Gibbs free energy of the of the hydroxy group. An optimal catalyst should be around zero, but in most cases you find that the optimal catalyst, an ideal catalyst should be around zero. But in most cases you have that the optimal catalyst is at the top of this peak. Now, several studies have shown that uh, this scaling relationship is being broken for some systems. But for now, um, in most cases, this kind of volcano type plot is what is used to understand the mechanistic, um, the, the mechanism of this reaction. Now, if you think about just going back now to I motivated why we are interested in the acidic medium. Now, if you look at the cathode react the cathode part of the reaction, you've got four hydrogen plus an electron to give you two uh, two molecules of hydrogen. And the problem in this reaction, like I mentioned, is the anode part, the oxygen evolution reaction. Now you will be splitting your your two molecules of water. You have one oxygen. And then you have four hydrogen, four, hyd four, four hydrogen ions and four electrons. So you have four protons. And then you have this activation energy of 1.2 EVs that you need to overcome. And this would form your overpotential. And the proposed mechanism in the acidic reaction, it involves a certain surface. And then you have water on the surface. The water would split into the OH and the H plus. And then you have an electron in your system that flows around. And then the OH on the surface would react with um, an OH in the water, in, in the water, in, in the in the in the in the in the in the medium, in your acidic medium. This would um leave O star plus H2O and then plus an electron. Then your O, the your O star, which is the you have two hydrogen on the, two oxygen on the surface. The two oxygen on the surface would react to give you to give you oxygen molecule, and then you have two surface sites. And this reaction also pro can proceed where you have an O star on the surface reacting with um, your H2O in the liquid, and then you have OOH star plus your protons plus electrons. Then your OOH on the surface would react with water in the liquid, and then you have a site, which is just shows your surface, plus two oxygen, plus an oxygen molecule, and then plus um, your, your proteins plus electrons. Now, to fully understand this proposed mechanism, we would have to, we would have to do um, DFT calculation to understand, to be able to calculate um, the different surfaces and the different reaction intermediates. Now, if you think about this, when um, we technically use um, H2O and um, we use H2O and then we'll use H2 in the gaseous phase as our, as our reference system. And part of the reason is because using density functional theory calculations, we can actually accurately determine um, we can actually we can add, accurately determine the the energies at zero potential for these systems. So here you would see that um, for this we can determine our O star, our OOH star, uh, our OOH star, and our OOH star based on these equations. And I'll show you the values we calculated for these systems. 
Now, the adsorption energies of, um, so remember I, I explained previously that we needed um, to calculate our Gibbs free energies for G1, G2, G3, G4, and taking the maximum of these will give us the over potential for the system. Now the over potential, our G1 is equivalent to GOH star. Our G2 is equivalent to GO star minus GOH star. Our G3 is equivalent to GOOH star minus GO star. And our G4 is equivalent to GO2 minus GOH star. So for the GO2, the O2 you can determine um, simply from an experimental value or we can calculate this value. So of note is that um, the water splitting reaction, as you can see here, is a four electron step. Unlike our oxygen, our, our, our water, our, our oxygen evolution reaction is a four electron step. And so this is um, uh, a, a limiting step when, when we talk about water electrolysis. The oxygen part of the reaction determines the, the kinetics of the reaction because it's very slow in comparison to the hydrogen evolution reaction. So the structures we use um, to model this um, water splitting reaction is iridium oxide. And just to mention that uh, South Africa is um, iridium has gotten as a byproduct of um, platinum or of PGM mining. So after you mine, if there's a lot of platinum mining, then we get a lot of um, iridium. So the iridium in the in the world can be calculated that is quite little, it's very minimal. So we have to use iridium as um, sparsely as possible. So we looked at um, iridium oxide surfaces and then we created an idealized surface. So this is your pristine iridium oxide surface with no dopants and no defects. And in here, you can see our iridium oxide surface with um, different transition metal and different, um, and then the, the transition metal substituted iridium and oxygen, and then the oxygen was substituted by fluorine, chlorine, and chlorine. Um, a lot of the details of this work can be found in this publication. What we've done here is we've calculated the dopant substitutional energy. And these, um, just to go over it, uh, this was also introduced by Professor Georges last time. So the dopant substitution energy for iridium, when you replace one iridium, you would need to evaluate the chemical potential for the transition metal and the chemical potential for the iridium and the overall doped system. This would give you the dopant substitution energy of that. Then if you look at this expression, this is the dopant substitution energy for iridium, as well as um, the transition, as well as um, the dopant substitution energy for a cation and an anion. So we introduce cation, which is our transition metal, and then our anion, which are either fluorine or sulfur. So you would have to subtract the transition metal that you are introducing. You have to subtract the iridium from the transition metal, as well as the oxygen from the from the anion you are introducing, you have to subtract the chemical potentials. Now it's just a similar expression, but an extra um, extra pollution. So if you look at for the cation system, for the introduction of the cation, just the cation alone, we found that um, they, from the dopant substitution energy, they are all negative, which implies that they are exothermic. And then for these cases as well, we for the anion rich conditions, we also found that they are all exothermic energies, which means that they are favorable. Now we need to evaluate the binding energies when you have um, two defects in, in the system. So if you have your, let's say, chromium substituting iridium and fluorine substituting oxygen. So we evaluated the binding energy for having chromium and fluorine, chromium and sulfur, both in the cation and the anion rich conditions. And the binding energy tells us that these systems would actually form stable configurations within the, within the lattice. All right, so I'm just showing this other expression. I'm sure you we saw this expression. This expression is similar to what we saw last um, last week, last two weeks. Now we look at the adsorption energy for molecules. So for us to adsorb a molecule, so in this case, you can see a small red ball. I'm sure there's a lot of balls here, but a small red ball that signify our oxygen 
being adsorbed on the surface. So the adsorption energy for oxygen on the surface can be evaluated using this field, where we have our molecule, our surface plus the molecule, and then we subtract just the surface and just the molecule. This will give us the adsorption energy. And we evaluated all these energies um, using density functional theory calculations. Now, next we also, this is when you have um, OH on the surface and then you have OOH on the surface. So we have different surface configurations. And then these surfaces are evaluated as well in the presence of different dopants and um, um, different cation or anion dopants. So I sort of introduced you uh, briefly to the different reaction steps that we are interested in. So what we did here was uh, we calculated the adsorption energies as I've showed you in the previous slide for oxygen. We calculated the adsorption energy um, for OH and then the adsorption energy for OOH. Now we need to convert this to the Gibbs free energy because we are interested in working with the Gibbs free energy. So the calculations, um, the calculations we performed are generally at zero Kelvin. Um, so we need to convert this to um, appropriate temperatures, which is room temperature. And then you convert it using the Gibbs free energy. And so you can see, I would, I'm showing you in the next slide what all of these and what um, GCT is, which is um, a correction. So we introduced several corrections to the energies we calculated to be able to calculate um, the Gibbs free energy. And then if you look at, um, we have um, here, we've got our hydrogen plus, the electric hydrogen, which is our proton. And then we can evaluate our proton taking into consideration the, taking into consideration the calculated energies of hydrogen uh, molecule and a correction to the energies of the hydrogen molecule. So in gaseous phase, generally, um, hydrogen molecule can be used as a good reference and it can be properly determined using density functional theory calculations. Now, I, I sort of um, jumped the gun, but this some of the corrections introduced, and these are for in medium oxide in particular, and these are taken from literature, we can actually calculate some of these values. So you can see that the total correction here, so our GCT is uh, will be the ZPE minus TS, and this is um, from the Gibbs free energy. So you can actually have um, the energy calculated from DFT plus our correction would give us the Gibbs free energy. And the chemical potential of the proton electron pair equals that of the gas phase. So if you think about your proton electron pair, which I showed previously, so I'll just go back. So we have our proton electron pair. It's equals to the energy of hydrogen plus a certain correction in the gas phase. So in this system, we have actually evaluated for the different configurations of interest. So for our iridium, um, chromium with iridium, manganese with iridium and ion with iridium, as well as uh, molybdenum with iridium, ruthenium with iridium, osmium with iridium, and tungsten with iridium. So we've evaluated all of the, the G naught, the, the GOH star, the GOOH star. And taking all these values we've calculated, we need to calculate our G1, G2, G3, G4. And the G1, G2, G3, G4, would give us our taking the the marks of this would give us the over potential for the reaction to proceed for this area for on this surface and this can also give us an indication of what are we would have improved um oer based on the materials we've introduced or not so if you look at our g1 I just showed you this slide again. The G1 is equal to GOH star. So I showed you we've evaluated the GOH star. G2 is GO star minus GOH star. So you perform this arithmetic to get GO, um, G2. G3 is GOH star minus GO star. And G4 is GO2 minus GOH star. So you can clearly see how we arrived at G1, G2, G3, G4. So in here, you can see the values of our G of our of iridium for of iridium calculated iridium and chromium um, for the different um, systems for delta one, delta two, delta three, um, 
delta G1, delta G2, delta G3, and delta G4, and we can see the calculated over potentials. So I've highlighted the calculated over potentials. So you see that for pristine ir iridium, when you introduce um, chlorine and oxygen on the surface, we can actually reduce the over potential. Now, introducing um, chromium, we reduce the over potential in comparison to pristine iridium. And so here I've showed that generally introducing these dopants, with, with notable exception of molybdenum, we have a molybdenum and um, tungsten, we have reduction in the over potential. And this, is gener this can be attributed more to more to maybe the lattice distortion um, based on the size of molybdenum and tungsten in the system, and as well as changes in the electronic properties. So just thinking about it, using the overpotential is um, a descriptor that has been widely um, used to evaluate improvement in catalytic property. But now we can actually go just beyond that to something more robust. So if you consider that um, oxygen evolution reaction is a multi-electron process, and just our overpotential is um, it's a single parameter system because if you look here, we take the max of delta G1, G2, G3, G3. So the maximum value here is subtracted from 1.2, and this is our overpotential. You find out that this is quite um, a simplified approach. So we need to take into um, the the multi-electron stops relevant. And doing that, it is essential to use a more um, a, a more robust um, descriptor. And this more robust descriptor is uh, the electrochemical step index. So just to mention, there is um, newer descriptors like the Gmax that has been introduced, that has been studied and are quite relevant for oxygen evolution reaction, but will not be discussed here. And the ESSI is relevant where Delta GI is greater than or equal to E0, and E0 is 1.2 EV. So if you look at this, for some of our systems, um, the, um, the Delta GI is greater than or equal to E0. So it means that these um, the ESSI can be applied to this. So um, looking at the electrochemical step index, we plotted these as a function of the of the over potential. Now, if you take the electrochemical step index as a function of the over potential, the black line signifies the our best seat for our, our our data, but the blue line is the ideal um is is what you would have for an ideal catalyst. So if you find if you look at this, you find out that most of what we considered do not fall around um do not fall around um the most of the dopant configuration are not are, would, wouldn't be good catalysts. But we found out that um magnesium iridium plus um magnesium substituting iridium and sulfur substituting oxygen, iron substituting iridium uh, with fluorine substituting oxygen and chromium substituting iridium and sulfur substituting oxygen. And then um, the sulfur oxygen dopant configurations fall around this line and would be good catalytic um, systems for this reaction. So uh, the take home message is that uh, the energetics and structural parameters of OER intermediates can provide significant insight into the nature of the surfaces and their suitability to catalyze OER reaction. Um, simplistic assumptions um, show that um, dopant complexes without OS and W are found to be better, better suited for OER reaction. So that's just looking at the simply taking the over potential. And then when we introduce the electrochemical in the um, step, uh, the electrochemical stop symmetry index, we found out that the presence of molybdenum, oxygen, and tungsten are not suitable candidate for this kind of um, for this kind of reaction. But then, as I mentioned in the previous slide, that manganese, ion, and chromium with sulfur replacing oxygen in the pristine system would result generally in improved OER activity. Now, I'll go to the next part of my presentation, which is like looking at um, liquid organic hydrogen carriers. So at HISA, we've got a pilot plant for, for liquid organic hydrogen um, carriers. And this pilot plant is centered on dehydrogenation. On um, We have hy hydrogenation and dehydrogenation reactions going on here. 
So just to talk about dehydrogenation reaction, which is important for the next part of my presentation. In general, dehydrogenation reaction would involve having um, aliphatic compound and taking out hydrogen until you form um, an aromatic compound. So you take out all of the hydrogen that can be taken out from, from these um, fully saturated compound to get um, a non-fully saturated, um, uh, um, from these um, fully hydrogenated compound to these um, fully saturated compound. And the, it, we, our reactions can produce, can proceed through different pathways. And I'll discuss these pathways that our reaction can proceed in the next slide. So like I was talking about, uh, explained previously, um, the hydrogenation reaction involves generating removal of hydrogen atoms from a molecule. And these molecules are aliphatic compounds, they are hydrogen rich. And why are they of interest? They are interesting because you can, you can store safe energy. They are stable, they are non-volatile. An example of some of these molecules that we um, that are being evaluated is metal cyclohexane, um, cyclohexane, dambesi, toluene, and um, a whole host of others. And why is this interested in terms of the high South Africa context? Is because it provides avenue for platinum group metal beneficiation. And you see that for this kind of reactions, most of what most of the um, catalysts we use are platinum group metals. Uh, um, looking at um, platinum modified base surfaces for, for as catalysts for liquid organic hydrogen dehydrogenation. Um, just to talk about um, why we need um, HVC. The calculation size for this system is about, we need about 210 calculations for this particular reaction we're interested in. And then our dehydrogenation reaction is kind of big because of the molecule size. And then so generally our system size is about 120 atoms. So uh, proper details of this study can be found in this work that um, was published in 2022. So what we've done here is we've, we have our surfaces. So for this particular system, we want to modify the surface to see if modification of the surface would improve the surface for dehydrogenation reaction of methyl cyclohexane to toluene. So first of all, we absorbed our modifiers, and these modifiers are generally compounds that can poison the surface, such as sulfur, um, phosphorus, lean, and um, silicon. So we introduced them in very minute quantities on the surface, and then we calculated if this our surface modifiers, so we call them, would be able to bind on the surfaces. From the calculated binding energies for the 211 and the 311 step surface is considered, you can see the values are all negative. And the implication of these negative energies is that these surfaces would form stable configuration. Now, we subsequently introduced our methyl cyclohexane with our surface modifier, and then we calculated the adsorption energies for this. So if you look at here, we have our various reaction intermediate, dehydrogenation intermediates. So your methyl cyclohexane, which is the first one, and then the various dehydrogenation intermediates, which I showed you in the first slide that we have to go, we stepwise remove each hydrogen, and then as well as uh, methyl, uh, as well as toluene. We find out that all of these are um, negative in the P211 and the P311 and then, and then the PT311 surfaces in the presence of the surface modifiers and um, without the surface modifiers. So the take home message is that all of these will form stable configurations on the surface. So if you think about this, it means that when we have this, our reaction will proceed. If you have, um, say, one positive energy, it means that that reaction would not proceed. Now, just to refresh your mind now that I've introduced you to, that I've talked about um, what we calculated. So our stepwise dehydrogenation reaction would involve removal of one hydrogen, one, um, one hydrogen for atom from each of the system until we get C7H2. And we calculated whether these would bind or not. And then like I mentioned previously, 
We need to also evaluate our reaction energies to find out if this reaction would proceed or not. And then in the next slide, we will calculate our reaction energies. And it would also calculate, evaluate our reaction pathway. So when you take out two hydrogen from the molecule and take out the next two hydrogen and the next two hydrogen, you would have taken out three hydrogen in this system. Or when you take out two, one, two, um, sorry, one um, hydrogen molecule and two hydrogen molecule, you'd have taken out three hydrogen molecule. Or if you just take out three hydrogen molecules straight from your methyl cyclohexane from into lean. So we want to understand how this reaction would proceed, which step, which steps are limiting or which steps are not limiting. So just um, looking at this, on the different surfaces we've considered, we've calculated the reaction energy for hydrogen abstraction in our platinum 211 and in our platinum 311 surface. And then the highest energy states are in bold. So you can see that the, the, for the pristine surfaces, the, there is no specific pattern being followed whether you are looking at um, sulfur as a modifier. So for the pristine surface, sorry, this, um, um, the high, the, 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 the the energies here are the same because it's just it's just one system. But when you introduce one sulfur as a modifier or silicon or, or phosphorus or tin, we don't have any specific pattern for the dehydrogenation pathway. Actually, the dehydrogenation pathway varies. But something of note is that um, for the removal of each hydrogen, it favors the uh, if you take out the first hydrogen, the removal of the second hydrogen would favor the nearest the um, the hydrogen closest to it. So if you take out, um, I'm just going to go back now. If you take out hydrogen, say from one, the removal of the next hydrogen would favor either two or three. And this is kind of this is kind of um, important because the formation of double bonds is actually favored generally when you do the dehydrogenation reaction than actually random formation of radicals all around um, your molecule. Um, just to, okay. So, it, um, sorry. Yeah. So now we considered um our reaction pathways, like I explained in the previous slide, so we can take out uh, the first, um, we can take out individually hydrogen molecules. So we take out three hydrogen molecules, or we take out one hydrogen molecule, and then subsequently two hydrogen molecules, or pathways, you take out two hydrogen molecules, and one hydrogen molecule, or we just take out three hydrogen molecule. So the three hydrogen molecule generally gives us our overall reaction. And this is kind of very good to understand our reaction pathway, like um, how our reaction would proceed. And it gives us good information about to tell us if our system is improved or not improved. And you see the implication in the next slide. So this is for the 211 surface. So we, we also observed something similar to the previous slide that there is no specific um, order um, when you use um, these um, modifiers in your system. And part of the reason why is due to the different chemical natures of the different modifiers that is used. But generally you would find out that um, Going, going stepwise, taking out two hydrogen, um, one hydrogen molecule stepwise is generally more favored than going from um, one hydrogen molecule to two hydrogen molecule. And this is generally quite intuitive. So the same, um, in the same um, observation was made for platinum 311 surface, surface. And then I'll just go to our, um, you would see I kind of concentrated in the next slide at, um, pathway D, which is taking out three hydrogen molecule, uh, which is our overall reaction. And then something of note is that um, if you look at this, this is our pristine, and then this is our pristine. So the important thing you can see here is that the overall reaction is generally reduced at low hydrogen concentration, at low, sorry, surface modifier concentration, and that's kind of important for, so it will tell you that the P211 sulfate, when you introduce low hydrogen, um, low hydrogen, you kind of improve the overall dehydrogenation reaction. But in general, for the P311 um, sulfate, this is not generally the case. So take home message is that 
the P211 step surface compared to the P211, um, which I didn't discuss here, but we worked on previously, is found to res re result in reduced reaction energy for fully dehydrogenated metal cyclohexane to tooling. And the implication is that we can enhance the catalytic behavior for dehydrogenation of metal cyclohexane on the modified surfaces at low concentration. So I've spent a lot of time just introducing you to those um to the reason why we're doing the hydrogenation reaction. And then I um, showed you that we've done that on platinum step surfaces, and we've also done that on platinum um, flat surfaces, which are the terraces. I've also talked about um, iridium oxide for water splitting. Now we also applied um tin platinum based surface for dehydrogenation reaction. And I hope you still remember the reason I mentioned why it's important. So we want to restore hydrogen on this molecule. And so we can ship our um, molecule to somewhere else in the world. And then we can perform a dehydrogenation reaction to take out the hydrogen we've stored. And then we get back our molecule intact. Now for this as well, the same... Um, the same assumption why this is um why high throughput um, why high performance computing is needed is because the calculations are large about 110 calculations and then the system size we have about 120 atoms per per unit cell and also we evaluated um, um four different surfaces for this reaction to see if these surfaces would result in improved catalytic um reaction. Now, the, you can find a lot of details on this work in this paper. So first of all, we for us to evaluate the stable surfaces the, um, for the stable alloy configurations, we use the convex hull approach to determine our stable alloys. And then we, 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 just, we made a cutoff. We are like, we want to look at just low platinum-based surfaces. So can we actually reduce our platinum loading? Uh, because from our previous studies, we found that if we introduce tin, we can improve the dehydrogenation reaction. Now the, the question is, can we make an alloy and reduce platinum loading? So we took, um, we neglected um, systems with high concentration of platinum like SMPT3 and um, drew a straight line at 50-50 configuration. So for this kind of reaction, the dominant facets, we determine the dominant facets for using wolf construction. And the reason why we are interested in the dominant surface is that if a surface dominates, this surface will technically be where the reaction will mainly occur. So I'll be a lot faster here because I've introduced you generally to the background of um, this study. Now, from here, we have evaluated what are our molecules we bind on the surfaces using um, the adsorption energies. And we find here that our molecules will generally adsorb on all of the surfaces. And then the intermediates as well for CH4, we found out that CH4 and all of its inter C C7H14, as well as the intermediates for the react for the dehydrogenation reaction and the formation of toluene would, would stably bind. So, from here, we further evaluated. So I showed you the part where we considered part A, part B, part C, and part D, which I discussed previously. And then we compared um, the overall reaction energy with that of platinum. So for pristine platinum, we previously calculated that the overall reaction energy will be 89.28. So for our computation, we found out that SN4PT has a very low dehydrogenation energy. And the rest of the system has um, low overall reaction energy. Just something to note, and then I'll mention, I'll, I'll actually mention this in the next slide, is that there is a consequence that just thinking about this strictly only in terms of the overall dehydrogenation energy is actually not right. And part of the reason is because for some of this reaction, if you think about it just strictly, so if you look about at step D, if you think about it, it's just in terms of the overall dehydrogenation energy, we would say SN4 platinum alloy is the best dehydrogenation catalyst. 
But this might not necessarily be true again because we have not fully evaluated all of the activation energies for this reaction. And so the activation energies can also contribute. But this we didn't evaluate in the current study. Uh, part of this um, study has um, been patented. So we currently have a US patent on this, um, some of this work. So um, I'll just give a, a brief overview. I was supposed to talk on a different system, but I just decided I should talk about this just as a refresher to some of the work I do with my collaborator, Georges. So we do photocatalysis and photovoltaic, particularly for 2D materials, looking at genuine transition metal, looking at MOS2 and um, transition um, metal, um, genuine transition metal, the charcoal side considering WS2 which is um, a transition metal dichalcogenide. So part of this study, we've used um, the CHPC for it. And this current study has been published. First of all, similar to what we've been doing previously, we need to evaluate the binding energy. So when you bring two heterostructures together, you need to evaluate if they will bind, and you need to consider different stacking configuration to find out what is the preferential stacking configuration and which surface is preferred in terms of which surface would bind the molecule more better. And from our calculation, we found that all of these configurations are negative and we took the most stable, the lowest energy configurations for, for our further investigation. As shown here where we have um, AA1-SE for MOSSE, AA1, AA, AA1 or II dash T, and then AAII dash SE. So these are our lowest energy configuration. You can kind of see them. So um, we kind of discussed how these configurations were built, but if you have any question in the question time, I'm glad to just um, go into more details about this. So the important implication from this study is that we actually need a couple of things to be able to find if these would be a good photocatalyst. For a good photocatalyst, we want a band gap of around 1.23 uh, electron volt. This means that it falls within the visible range. And then we need the, the system to straddle around these, um, these lines, so to be outside this line. So we need, when we calculate our HER and OER part, they need to just be like for this part, you find out that this is good for the oxidation reaction, but this is for the for the for the oxygen reduction reaction, but this is not good for hydrogen evolution part. So for this, we find out that um, this is generally not going to be fairly okay. So from this study, we can we can tell that these configurations are not good for water splitting reaction, for the redox reaction. But we calculated the photovoltaic um, solar cell efficiency. And we can find that um, using these expressions here, which was discussed in detail by judges, you would find out that generally there is improved power conversion efficiency for this system where we have this kind of stacking configuration. So this study kind of opens the door for actually looking at um, genus transition metal and molybdenum the charcoal system as possible systems for photovoltaic application. Um, we also looked at a um, genus transition metal that have, um, sorry, I think this was to be WA, this is um, a typo, this was to be WSE2 heterostructure. We evaluated um, this genus transition metals with um, WSE2 heterostructures. So we had different heterostructures that we considered uh, just go in the interest of time to the next slide. So from the from the band structure of this um, system, we find out that we have something called a staggered type two band gap in Figure A, and this staggered type two band gap is kind of important. This type this type of band alignment is important when you want to evaluate our photocatalytic systems. And then for the different systems we've considered, they all have this staggered type two band gap, which is important. And then we evaluated um, a whole host of, um, we evaluated different pH range, so pH 0, pH 7, and pH 14. And then you would find that um, 
at that the systems are generally not good, but one of the system is kind of good. And then um, I talked about it here, which is our WSET, EWSET heterostructure is good for full water splitting under the basic and acidic condition. So this system is quite good under both basic and acidic condition. And this, um, this should open the door for further experimental um, evaluation. Um, at this juncture, I'd like to um, end um, the, the presentation. And then I'll just mention a few of my collaborators. So some collaborators I've had in this project, um, um, we have um, Georges here, which is also part of um, the presenter. I had Yedofana, which is part of the presenter. I'm closely working with uh, Professor Victor and Professor Aigodu. So, and I have a whole host of other collaborators that are not listed here. Um, some of this work was done in collaboration with my students in, uh, mainly with my students in Ethiopia. Um, so, um, a host of them have graduated. I didn't present um, work that was done by my students in Nigeria and uh, my students in Algeria. But last but not the least, I'd like to thank NITEX for the opportunity to give this presentation. I got some funding for the, from the Sherlock project with regards to the um, Iridium, soft, the Iridium and the Platinum um, studies. And I also thank NITEX and um, NICIS and the CHPC for computing facility. And thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Kingsley Apollo, for that very interesting um, presentation. Um, are there any questions? I don't see any questions in the Q and A. Um, if you have a question, please please feel free to type it in the Q and A or um, raise your hand, and I should be able to unmute you. If you have a question. I guess the question is quite clear. Yeah, maybe we can just wait 30 seconds uh, in case people are typing. Uh, okay, I see there's one question uh, in the Q&A. Um, so the participant says, um, have any of the systems been realized experimentally? Um, uh, thank you very much for the question. So in terms of experimental realization, what we're doing is, um, so I'll just go to the iridium-based systems. So what we do is uh, we have um, reduced iridium, so which forms the basis for, for um, this um, fundamental understanding. And um, so just the... Uh, so we have reduced iridium surface that is made in high side that is used for this kind of reaction that goes into the full electrolyzer system. So in terms of um, so this reduced iridium, you can you can think about it as um, iridium oxide having um, some form of oxygen um, in the system. So this is kind of very active, and then we. In terms of experimental realization as well, we've um, we have, we make some platinum based systems where we introduce um some form of dopants as uh, modifiers. So thinking about sulfur where we introduce like limited amount and um, I don't think um, I have a um, full answer with regards to the platinum based system. If, um, if we have a patent on that, we have a patent on the platinum based system using these um, sulfur and tin based systems. But in terms of the actual chemistry, I, I don't know about um, if they have actually if it's actually commercially available or it's one of those experimental cartels we have in high so. so in terms of have they been experimentally realized, the iridium-based systems and the platinum-based systems have been experimentally realized within high Okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other questions, but maybe we can just wait again 30 seconds to see um, if any more questions come up in the chat. Um, if you also, if you'd like to ask your question live, then please just feel free to raise your hand again.
Okay, I'm assuming, okay, if I'm assuming there's no further questions, then um, I can maybe then thank our speaker again um, for the, the interesting presentation and hopefully um, I'll see you all again next week for the, the fourth and final lecture in the, uh, the NITEC mini school series. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. King-Ziaboro. And thank you to the participants. Hope, have a good afternoon, much. everyone. Thank you.